So that was a little bit exciting, that last video where I tried to go on the air with the 20 meter Hartley oscillator. Um, let's just say some people heard me. Now we had funny conditions uh, this week. We had a solar event, I think over the weekend or just before, and it uh, really made 20 meter kind of like, uh, 20 meters like cotton candy. Uh, there were some east coast propagation paths, but nothing to the west and I only heard one European station in the uh, 1406 kind of frequency range where I was working with the simple oscillator. So I don't think we were causing too much interference, but a lot of those East Coast stations did hear me, and there was some excitement, and uh, some guy said, you were moving so fast, I didn't know how to answer you. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So we had a little bit of drift problem. We had a horrible note, of course, uh, putting out uh, about 7 watts, of power into a low dipole. So, oh, by the way, this this transmitter here is a Meisner oscillator. It's a little older circuit from the early 20s. It's using an O1A tube as the oscillator, and it puts out about a watt and a half. Makes a really interesting note on 80 meters. So there's four coils here. It's sort of a prototypical uh, oscillator circuit that you don't hear too much about, but. Anyway, I wanted to show something uh, at the beginning of this video so you guys just weren't staring at me. You could stare at this other transmitter. So let's try to fix up the uh, 20 meter uh, one tube transmitter so that we can use it on the air without feeling embarrassed or scaring people off as I did uh, Monday and Tuesday when I tried to make a couple of contacts. Let's try to fix this thing so I can use it in part two of the contest, uh, the 1929 Bruce Kelly contest this weekend and uh, make more contacts. Well, I've had a lot of comments and questions about the 20 meter Hartley oscillator and I thought I'd do a little follow-up video. The first question is, is a transmitter like this even legal to use on the air? And that's a good question. Right now I think it's probably too unstable to be considered to be something that I'd want to put on the air, except maybe during the contest just for some short contacts once a year. But uh, it's not like I'm giving up on the transmitter. I mean, you basically take a transmitter like this, and every year when the contest comes around, you make improvements, and you try to make it better and better every year. One thing that I wanted to do was to try to get it a little more cleaned up for this weekend. So the first place I'm looking is the power regulation. Uh, power regulation on my choke input power supply with a decent bleed is less than 10 percent. But less than 10 percent means it droops about 40 volts. So when you go from key up to key down with this transmitter, the voltage is changing 40 volts out of, you know, 500. And uh, that's what's made you, making the chirp. So the first thing I'm going to do is regulate the power. Now I understand this is not something they could do in the 1920s too effectively, but if you overbuild the power supply and use a stiff bleeder, um, the, the 40 milliamps of power this thing is taking, if the power supply is capable of 500 milliamps or something, is going to be very minor and you're going to get almost no voltage droop and you would accomplish the same thing. Good regulation. I made the output link a lot heavier. You can see this. It's now number 10 wire. And uh, I'm still doing very light coupling. And the third thing that I did was I started playing with the resistor in the grid leak. I started out with a resistor that was a 5 watt carbon composition uh, at around 8.2K. And now I have increased that to a 20 watt wire wound resistor and lowered the value some to put more current into the tube. So we're going to see what that does as well. Finally, I had some questions on how clean is this thing. I'd like to see the spectral analysis of this thing, for instance, uh, on the second harmonic. So we'll take a look at that as well. So those are some things that we can do uh, to try to clean this up a little bit.
uh, with my power regulator. I'll show you the schematic. This is something I've used on a lot of different circuits. Um, I've especially used it on the ARC-5 command sets. It's basically just a stack of zeners and a pass device. In this case it's a high voltage MOSFET. This MOSFET is rated for 600 volts DC uh, drained to source. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, that's a minimum rating, by the way, on those MOSFETs when they rate them in volts. And it, it's very happy. It has no problem putting out the 30 or 40 milliamps that the tube wants. The regulation's excellent. It's less than a volt of change. So let's see how that cleans up the node a little bit. Also, I put in one more stiffener on the panel uh, since you saw it last. Let's see how this thing keys now. Well, the node is cleaned up. It's drifting a little bit. Not bad. I think we can fix that drift with the tap, but uh, boy, the node is really clean. So it looks like that voltage droop is what was causing the chirp. It's drifting down. That's not bad actually. Shifting down just a little bit. So let's try to correct that with the tap. But yeah, very much improved on the note. So let's look at the uh, the harmonics next. I have a small uh, spectrum analyzer that I can hook up to a antenna that I have in the woods that I use for noise. I mostly use it for noise measurements. It's kind of like a, a small inverted L. And uh, that's separated from the uh, dipole antenna by enough that I think we can make a good a second and third harmonic type measurement on the signal and see what the relationship of the harmonics are to the fundamental. We're putting out uh, about 7 watts so we need to see what our uh, harmonic content is to see if the transmitter is even legal. Okay we're looking at the tiny SDR and as you can see uh, 20 meters is very busy as well as the 19 meter shortwave band. We've got signals showing on my uh, noise antenna out in the woods, which is uh, basically a little inverted L antenna. It's about 200 feet away from the transmitting dipole. So, let's, uh, let's transmit and see uh, if we can see the fundamental, the second harmonic, and the third harmonic. We should be able to see all three on this 10 to 50 megahertz sweep. So you guys are probably wondering what I'm using for an antenna. It's a simple dipole up about 20 feet maybe. A simple 20 meter dipole and it goes right into the shack right in that window. Okay, we can see the second and the third plainly. Looks like they're both about equal which is great because we know the dipole's helping on the second. And the third is just basically uh, what's left over. It's actually quite amazing how far down the second harmonic is. It's almost 60 dBc. And the third harmonic is even lower. Uh, the second harmonic is being helped by the dipole itself, which tends to reject the second harmonic because it's a high impedance at that frequency and you only have 50 ohm coax. At the third harmonic it will radiate but by that time, uh, you're far enough away from the fundamental that you've got some natural protection. This is all due to the very high Q tune circuit and the fact that we don't have a lot of other stages involved, all of which can bring up harmonic energy. So there have been grandfathering rules, but uh, basically you need to be 43 dB below the, uh, the mean carrier. The FCC does this remote measurement technique as well. Um, they'll typically be a block or two away in the far field and they'll make a measurement of your complete station including your coax tuner and your antenna. They're not going to come into your house and hook something up. They want to know what you're actually radiating and if you meet the 43 dBc. So others have been interested in seeing what this looks like on a web SDR 
So I, I'm trying to find a remote web SDR that can pick up the signal. Okay, I've got a web SDR open and this station is in Georgia and it's about 10 o'clock in the morning. Hopefully we can get to Georgia on our 7 watts and it will show up on this waterfall display. Let's, let's try it. Yeah, there we are. Okay, so it does work. That's being heard in Georgia. So the little dipole is doing its work. <laughs> He's trying. <laughs> Five, seven, nine. <laughs> Now let's see if he can follow me. <laughs> like the old days when I got on, 1953. So it's not perfect, but uh, I think I've made some progress on the transmitter. Uh, we now have a good note at least. I would say we're wavering up and down about 500 hertz. It seems to drift one direction at first and then it kind of goes through the middle and then it starts to uh, change directions. So I'm not going to go any further with this transmitter this year, but next year when we get close to the contest I'll start to work on that and try to calm it down. It might be just a matter of running less voltage, uh, less heating of the parts, uh, probably the less drift of the frequency, but I've made some significant improvements 
instead of the 595, I now have a 579. And, uh, you know, the, the guy that I was talking to there, the Canadian, he was using a QRP rig at 5 watts, and he probably had very limited filter options. So he had to really tune around and follow my signal as I drifted around. But um, he was able to do it. At least he gave it a shot. And uh, we had a good QSO. Exchanged our, we exchanged our SKCC numbers and all that good stuff. So I hope you've so. enjoyed this uh, little two-part series on the 20-meter uh, one-tube transmitter to be used in the 1929 Bruce Kelly Memorial Contest.